How did you become interested in gerontology? That's a great question. And my interest began actually uh, when I was um, an undergraduate and I was taking a lifespan developmental psychology class. And I uh, learned about um, uh, I learned about the life course, and I was quite amazed to hear at that point to see a graph which showed uh, the aging process and precipitous decline at end of life, and that uh, interested me. And also the statistic at that point, which uh, now I understand later on is is kind of misinterpreted the way I first learned it. At that point, I, I had heard a statistic that five percent of persons over the age of 65 uh, were institutionalized. Okay. Now, then I understood later that well, that's that's a cross-sectional analysis, and that what one really thinks about how long someone might be institutionalized, um, it might be at some point in your life, about 30 percent of older adults might experience that either in a short-term rehab or a long-term care facility. However, at that point, I wondered, well, what about all those other people living at the margin in their communities? And the professor, who his name was Larry Goulet and this was at the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana uh, in 1973, actually. Um, I, he told me, I first heard the term gerontology, and I said, that's the area that I would like to pursue. And can you describe your career trajectory as a gerontologist? Yes, um, I uh, went directly into graduate school. I went to the Heller School at Brandeis University. Uh, I actually entered before my 21st birthday. Uh, my birthday's in October, so I entered in, uh, at age 20, and it took me six years to get my PhD, and it was one of those things where they did not have a, uh, an option for an en route master's or a terminal master's degree, so it was either once you started this program, you either finished it, or uh, you were faced with having put all, invested all that time into your education and not having uh, uh, completed the degree. And I'd also like to add that uh, also as an undergraduate, um, in my junior year of college, I was at Hebrew University in Jerusalem study abroad, and I uh, started off uh, by volunteering in an autistic nursery school. And I realized at that point in time that this was not a population that I could reach, and it was very frustrating for me. And I knew that at, at that point that um, this w that that wasn't going to be my career path to work with autistic children. I then uh, had another replacement. Uh, with uh, older adults, uh, actually in a uh, in a mental institution, and I um, I related a little, a little bit uh, better in that case, and uh, I enjoyed that kind of experience. And then when I came back to uh, campus, University of Illinois, I had uh, at an internship in a uh, county nursing home, and I really related uh, well with those uh, older adults. And also, actually, also had another summer uh, internship experience with the Jewish Community Centers in Chicago uh, in the senior adult department, and it was with a uh, well elders and uh, doing uh, programming uh, with with uh, individuals going to the senior center there. And I was realizing that I was connecting with people. Um, I was enjoying ex the experience; they were enjoying the experience. And so, one could say that uh, I would not have defined it at that point in time in the 70s as service learning, but it was experiential applied learning, and um, it reinforced that this was the population I wanted to, to, uh, to work with in my career. And at what point did, in your career did you embrace gerontologists to describe yourself? Unlike many of my colleagues who, um, who came into gerontology because funding was available, I was intentional. I knew that I wanted to be a gerontologist, and I sought out programs, doctoral programs, that, uh, that offered gerontology in, in some way or another, whether it was a, a concentration, uh, specialization, um, or, um, or a defined program. And at that point in time, which was 1974, going into graduate school, there were not doctoral, doctoral programs in gerontology were not yet uh, prevalent or on the board or created, established. Uh, it was later that the University of Southern California uh, became our first, and then the campus that I'm at, University of Massachusetts Boston, was the second doctoral program. So, um, but I knew, I knew that I uh, defined myself as a gerontologist. I will say, though, that I did benefit from the uh, Administration on Aging Training Grant uh, to, at Brandeis University. They offered that, and that uh, certainly helped out with my doctoral training. 
So I've been a gerontologist uh, for a long time. I tell my students this is a great field to age in and um, uh, to embrace it and to also understand the whole um, balance of, uh, of that it's not all rosy and it's not all um, all negative that uh, that how do how do we respond how do we cope how do we uh, um, achieve um, uh, the how do we how do we embrace the, the challenges of daily living and the opportunities that we have through aging so um, did you have female mentors who impacted your move into gerontology actually um, it's interesting at that point in time um, I would say that I was attracted to uh, Brandeis University Heller School because of male uh, mentors, and, and those were uh, Bob Binstock, Jim Schultz, um, Robert Morris. Um, these were uh, great, uh, great scholars in, in, in aging, uh, and also Rob Hudson. There were, uh, there were not women at that point that, uh, that I was drawn to that, oh, how could I, it, actually, I, actually, let me step back. Um, I was also accepted to the University of Chicago, and they had the Committee on, uh, on Human Development, perhaps that was the name of the program, and Bernice, Bernice Newgarden. So one, uh, she clearly um, was uh, a, major, uh, a major legend, a major force in gerontology. However, I am from Chicago, and the idea of coming to Boston uh, was, was really uh, something that, w that attracted me greatly. So I don't know if I, was, uh, if I lived in another part of the, of the states, Maybe I would have uh, been uh, under Bernice, Bernice Newgarden. I would also say, though, that um, early study of gerontology, uh, women that, uh, that I greatly admired, Marjorie Cantor, Janet Saner, uh, these were all uh, you know, women whose work I read, Elaine Brody. Uh, the um, thinking about Marjorie Cantor uh, in terms of her whole uh, sense of social support and the networks and the whole um, Know, connecting people with services and programs that uh, resonated with me. So there clearly there were women that I would not define as my direct mentors, but I was influenced by their uh, by their work. So what is unique about being a woman gerontologist? I think that at this point in time, um, aging is strongly a women's issue, and uh, we know that from our demographics. And uh, we also know that, um, that at this point in time, um, pioneers uh, in aging, the, the role models, you know, the understanding what the next transitions uh, will be uh, in life, uh, we're just kind of breaking that ground. So um, I think that that's uh, something that um, uh, I'm not afraid of. And uh, the, um, the field is, uh, is, is, is open. Uh, to, uh, to trying new things and uh, falling down and getting back up again and uh, redirecting yourself. And uh, I know that AARP talks about reimagining, and I think that, yes, there's an opportunity to reimagine, reinvent, uh, renew, uh, and, um, and just try, try another pathway. So it's very exciting. Uh, I tell my students that there's nothing that they cannot do and that they think of anything that I could take any, anything that they talk to me about, about career directions and connect it back to aging, um, whether or not it's in the, in the uh, public sector or it's in the private sector, or they come up with a, an issue that, uh, that um, has not yet been addressed and an opportunity to be a social entrepreneur. For example, um, uh, my, uh, my own parents uh, are in their 90s and one of the earlier uh, struggles or issues that they had was in um, meal preparation. So I had an online student, I live in Boston, my parents are in Chicago, I had an online student who was uh, from Chicago and uh, into the semester, um, even though this wasn't the topic of our, of our course, I happened to ask her um, if there was any chance that she would be interested in, in uh, preparing meals, you know, going out to uh, my parents and, and doing some cooking uh, in the house. And she was open to it. And I said, but when you talk to my parents, do not say that you're going there to prepare meals. You're going there as a private chef, personal chef. And when you think of the language that people use and how we're talking to uh, older adults, that was much more um, appealing to them. And when she uh, went to my parents' house the, uh, the first day, and I called later, and I asked, uh, you know, so how did it go? My mother's reaction was, the house smells so good. And my feeling was, wow, I you know, hadn't really thought about that. If you haven't been cooking, 
in, in a long time, you know, your house does smell differently. So that, that was some uh, greater insight. Not sure that it goes directly to the question you asked, so I'll ask you to repeat the question that brought me on that tangent. Um, it was, <laughs> what is unique about being a oh, okay. woman gerontologist? <laughs> yeah, so it really does, it, uh, it, it, um, it does, I don't know that it would be unique about being a woman gerontologist. Um, I think it's just uh, probably unique about, uh, about being a gerontologist, which is still a relatively new, young field um, uh, in, um, in, in the academy. Uh, how has being a gerontologist interacted with your own personal aging process? Well, I think that that was a good example. Yeah. Uh, here's, um, it amazes me that uh, you, know, you hear this of, of other professions, that uh, the psychologist's child is the one who has the most trouble, or, or, uh, um, or the last one to, uh, the cobbler's child is the last one to have shoes. Well, in, um, I have been in the field for a long, long time, and yes, uh, colleagues, friends, um, people uh, at the university, uh, I'm always receiving uh, calls for questions, for advice, and you know, what do I do in this situation, what do I do in that situation? So now that I find myself in the situation of being the adult daughter, uh, living at a distance um, with um, with siblings who uh, one who lives in, near my folks and one who uh, also lives at a distance you know the kinds of things that we teach about I'm experiencing and I'm finding that not everything that uh, you know that I am I would advise to others is actually working out for me so um, that's been uh, I'm in I would say I'm, I'm actively in that situation right now and it's causing me to reflect a little bit more and how I uh, advise others. I would say that uh, the classic thing is that uh, one thing I always tell others is, you know, the best thing you could do is to get a private geriatric care manager and have someone work with, uh, work with figuring out the whole system and network and responding and, and mediating with families and everything else and uh, cannot convince my family to go that route, so it's interesting uh, to, to me. Um, the Wiggle Project focuses on the legacies of older women gerontologists. Within that framework, is there anything else that you would like us to know? Yes, I think that um, uh, I've also been privileged to, um, to really take an active role in the professional organizations that have shaped our field. and so. Um, as a uh, graduate student that I had mentioned uh, while at Brandeis, I was uh, co-chair of the student uh, chair or co-chair of the student organization for GSA, the Gerontological Society of America. So I've kind of grown up in that uh, profession, in that professional society. And um, then uh, later, uh, as a uh, um, newer professor uh, at, um, well, I taught for you had asked about tra trajectory before, so. After getting my degree, um, I uh, then was an adjunct professor at Simmons College School of Social Work for 10 years. And this is interesting uh, to me and going probably goes back to uh, being a woman. Um, at that point, I had two young children. And I was determined that no, I would, I, going tenure track was not what I had wanted to do at that point. So I was doing adjunct uh, uh, work, part-time work. And for those of you who have done part-time work, and at, that, it's, at one point I was at three different universities, you've got three different briefcases, You're, each day was uh, going off to another university trying to arrange childcare, and uh, uh, in a time where we weren't using technology as we are now. And what I uh, took a long time to realize, but I realize it's, you know, it's harder to work part-time than it is to work full-time. And um, uh, then after that point, when uh, I was doing uh, on a research grant, I came over to the University of Massachusetts Boston um, Gerontology Institute, and being in the right place at the right time, a teaching opportunity uh, emerged, and I started uh, teaching in the gerontology program. And then two years later, um, a, they were advertised. There was a tenure track uh, line that had opened up. And at that point when I realized that, gee, other people, they're interviewing other people, I might as well apply for my own job at that point. So um, the difference there is that I started tenure track probably later than a man would when they would first uh, you know, come out of uh, college. So um, a classic is my, uh, my daughter 
if I could recall her, com I have two daughters, and one coming home and saying, you know, we're, I was in a sociology class, Mom, and they were talking about how women in their 50s, um, you know, start uh, um, withdrawing, you know, from the workforce or things like that. And she goes, and I was thinking, everything that the professor was saying really did not apply to you. And I think that this is where chartering, chartering new paths, um, yes, I mean, I probably uh, looked at my 40s and 50s, and now I'm uh, 62, that, um, no, I was just getting going uh, at, at that point, and I um, could not be more active than I am uh, now. And I'm very, so I mentioned uh, being involved with the Gerontological Society of America. Uh, then in the early 90s, maybe it was mid-90s, started becoming more active with the Association for Gerontology and Higher Education, and found that as my educational home and my research home with, uh, with GSA. And um, what I find among gerontologists is that people are not afraid to, uh, to do what it takes to, um, to make a difference and to collaborate and to, uh, to cooperate. So, um, you know, not, it's one thing to, to, uh, to say this needs to be done, this needs to be done, this needs to be done. But what you find among uh, my colleagues in gerontology is I'll do it. And, uh, and working together to, to get to that vision, that shared vision that we have.